The psychedelic revolution is here. If you want to integrate your visionary experiences into your purpose, get clear on your entrepreneurial path and help people while you do what you love, then this podcast is for you. Welcome to The Psychedelic Entrepreneur, medicine for these times. I'm your host, Beth Weinstein. I'm a spiritual business coach, three-time entrepreneur, and a lifelong student of psychedelics and sacred plant medicines. You carry your own unique medicine, and your medicine is what we need for these times. This podcast will help you to share your medicine so you can create transformation in the world. Listen in on conversations with psychedelic leaders, change makers, and conscious entrepreneurs who are living proof that a better world is possible when you follow your heart and live in alignment with your soul. You're about to hear part two of my interview with Charles Eisenstein. We spoke for almost two hours. Last week was part one. So please go back and listen to part one, whether it's after you're done with this interview or before you listen to this interview. I don't want you to miss it. This incredible conversation with him has been very life-changing for me ever since we spoke just a few weeks ago. So here we go with part two. Be sure to catch part one in last week's episode. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy. The one thing I hear the most and the one thing I personally have, um, you know, really wake up and ask myself every day and, you know, I have a process, a, a really deep connection or prayer process of like, you know, help me serve. Um, guide me, you know, like I use me as a vessel, but there are, including myself, there's a lot of people out there who feel this sense of like, what more can I do? Like, I don't have the clout as Charles Eisenstein. So what good am I? Like, what can I do? And there is this sense of like wanting to contribute. You know, I do think it's inherently in our nature, as you say, it's like, there's doesn't matter who, what your background is, your circumstances. It's it, There is this human nature that we are, you know, it's inherently in us wanting to help, wanting to make a change, wanting to contribute to beauty and live fully in the life. But what would you say to people, especially like, let's just say the common person, you know, here in the United States as someone who's working, trying to survive, you know, going through the motions of life, raising kids, family, but they want to they want to make a change. They want to contribute. You know, what what's the one suggestion you have? And of course, there's people feeling like I'm going to contribute by yelling at people on social media. <laughs> you know, or OK, so first first, I would say this. I would, I would ask this feeling of wanting to do more, wanting to contribute more. Where is that coming from? How much of it is from a sense of worthlessness of never enough. Nothing I do is ever enough. I'm not good enough. Um, how much of it is wanting approval of the parent, the internalized parent, the socialized parent? And how much of it is actually coming from a sense that I am not doing what I am here to do? There's something else, something more well, that often gets translated through our inherited ideas of what makes a change in the world. Mm. And our inherited ideas say the bigger, the better. And how do you know it's big? You can measure it. So if, I'm, if my essay or my words reach a million people instead of a thousand people, then I must be having a bigger effect, right? Well, not necessarily. And think <clears throat> of who that diminishes. It diminishes all of the um, nannies of this world who pour love into a child. And maybe that child goes on to, to do big things. And how often does the nanny get celebrated as much as the man out there doing big things? Mm -hmm. Like, who are we actually venerating here? Who are we upholding? Who are we, we admiring? The ones who get left out are the ones who t have been getting left out by patriarchy for thousands of years. The nannies and the grannies, the daycare workers, the people who are doing, who are like holding families together, the people who are taking care of one little garden or an animal. Now, the, the calculus 
of separation says they're not doing much to help. Not as much as, you know, Charles Eisenstein is doing with his big audience. Not that it's actually that big, but but that is the logic that we have to reject because it contradicts the heart's logic that recognizes exactly what you're supposed to be doing. So, so that feeling of I could be contributing more, I should be contributing more, as I said, where's it coming from? It might be, have a lot behind it from many directions. And the valid part of it really is saying, is saying, trust your heart. Because if you're not trusting your heart, then you will have the feeling, because that's the guidance, that's the, the, the orienting organ that helps us recognize what part ours is to play in the cosmic unfolding of life. So if, if you're not listening to your heart, then you will have the feeling that I should be doing, I could be doing more, that I'm not doing what I'm here to do. It could even be that, that your mind says, well, I'm doing great things. I'm, I'm working for global change. And your heart says, spend more time with your children. <laughs> like personally, like for me, I mean, I think my work is, is having a good effect in the world. But I don't know that as deeply as I know that my parenting is having a good effect on the world. Mm. Like as far as like what time in my life was well spent. I think a lot of my time wiggling my fingers on my keyboard in front of my computer was well spent. I know a lot of it wasn't. I think a lot of it was. But I know that my time pouring love into my children was well spent when I was really attentive to them. And I regret the times where I wasn't fully present and attentive to them because I thought I should be doing something big and important in the world. Mm. I had it backward. So this big, bigger contribution, this more, let's be sure not to filter that through the lens of separation. And to understand that bigger could be contained in a very, very intimate setting. Mm -hmm. It could be the biggest thing you do could be the time you spend with your with your with your father on his deathbed. Maybe that, and then maybe that's weeks and months, and you had to take out from all of the important things you're doing in your life to do that. But maybe that was the most important thing that you will ever do as far as how it impacts the future in 500 years, how it changes the field that we recognize from our psychedelic experiences to be interconnected, that we recognize that, that anything that happens in one place happens everywhere. Like this is the truth. We have to sit in this truth. And when we do, then the heart and the mind will no longer be in conflict. Yeah, you know, this this whole narrative of separation and the, the ego mind that, that wants to do, and like you mentioned, like operating from core wounds, you know, it's like I see this a lot in my industry where it's like all of us are being called to help, you know, create transformation, but then there's this woundedness underneath a lot of it, right? It's like the doing, the, um, the helping, you know, there's these different um, archetypal patterns inside of us, you know, coming from who knows what. It doesn't even matter the story. It could be our life, you know, or in ancestral, intergenerational. But, you know, in the end, it's this this system-wide issue, right? This this feeling of wanting to do more, wanting to con contribute more, be a leader, make a change, um, be famous, whatever it is. So... Because I know this is actually came up for me huge at the, be at the beginning of the pandemic where I was like, what can I do? What can I do? And I just kept getting this. Um, I was actually in the middle of a, a dieta with uh, cacao. I was working with cacao in a really intentional way when, when the pandemic started. And it just kept telling me to just go garden and meditate more. And I was like, oh, OK, like that's that's a hard one to accept because the human mind, right? Like I want to produce this is that that feeling like this is that core separation problem in our society like at the root of all of um, maybe the larger scale issues you know always producing more always wanting more always wanting to take more 
And it is interesting because there's there's a lot of people talking about this idea of like, it, you know, how do we change this programming that has been in place for thousands and thousands of years of, you know, the, the patriarchal way of, you know, constantly adding more, doing more, taking more, um, creating more, more technology, more innovation, more, you know, like I got this thing in the mail the other day. It's like you can now get all this food delivered in the mail. I'm like, wait, we don't have time to cook food anymore. Like, really? It's just so then this deeper question lies, you know, is like if this is so much ingrained into our way of being and we see this happening, you know, with technology and um, the world that we're in where there's just constant like how are we going to keep fixing things or making things easier or making things better? And it is just this this constant sense of moreness, um, you know, and, and a lot of people in this plant medicine world have experienced the the opposite, you know, the ancient ways, right? Coming back to the ways things used to be. Um, and, and a lot of people, and me being one of them, knowing that maybe one of the world's, you know, maybe one of the answers is coming back to the old ancient ways of being, which I, God knows how long that will happen or if ever. But to know that, you know, these indigenous cultures with the simplicity, you know, with the children running around, with like, you know, not having technology, not having money, or, which by the way is not actually real um, because most indigenous cultures actually do still have money and are still operating in part of the system um, today in 2022. But what would you say um, about all this? Like, how do we then get to the core of this separation issue? And I mean, psychedelics might be one way, but are there solutions or is this something we're just going to have to, um, you know, trust, trust and let go of that control and just see how it all plays out? It's hard to give general answers to those questions because the the truth um, depends on the listener. So for one person, it could be, yeah, actually, you got to play a bigger game. You're holding yourself back. For another person, it might be you're, you, you think that you have to play this big game, but your real work lies somewhere else. It, for one person, the desire for more and bigger could be coming from ego. For another person, it could be coming from an obsolete theory of change. For a third person, it, be, it could be because that is actually what they're supposed to do. Mm. And to do that, they have to confront certain limitations. It's not a solution that I can or anyone can generalize and impose. That's actually part of the old story. The important thing is to recognize that there is a path from here to there. And what's there? We catch glimpses of it in various ways. So you mentioned ancient ways, indigenous ways. And often when we come into contact with people who are not fully living in modernity, we recognize that they know something, there's something there for us. And that doesn't mean that they're necessarily better in any way. I'm reading a David Graeber's new posthumous book called The Dawn of Everything. Uh, really, like, and, and he's, you know, in deep respect and humanization of the indigenous and, and a leftist and anarchist. But he's saying, like, this idealization of the indigenous and this belief that they all used to live in egalitarian societies and so on and so forth, says that's that's actually a kind of a dehumanization. We're projecting something onto them. They were just as complicated and flawed as any other human beings. They have, you know, beauty and ugliness in their societies. And, you know, like, I, I originally, before I came into contact with, with more indigenous and, and um, non-modern people, I tended to idealize them a bit as well. But then, like, I discovered, like, yeah, you know, they have, like, all of the gossip, all of the 
back backstabbing, the politics, like the jealousies, the rivalries, like they're not immune to any of humanity either. Uh, but there is something that that is visible in any non-modern society that uh, points us to home. And and so to, to, to recognize those things and to take them in uh, is, it's not a solution, but it helps orient us toward recognizing what the path is. And as I said, that path could be different for different people. Mm. How do you know what, you don't even have to know the path. All you need to know is the next step on the path. It's an invisible path that, that, and sometimes you don't even know until you take that step, what's going to happen. I, I like to say the path will rise to meet us. You, know, you step out into the unknown, knowing that it's the right step, and then the path appears. Mm -hmm. So yeah, in a sense, like you're right, it is a release of control. But it's not a reckless, random, you know, throwing everything to the wind. Yeah, I really hesitate to offer a simple instruction. Yeah. Although throwing the it to whole the idea, wind. How do we do it? You know, let's ask Charles. Let's fun. ask somebody. You know, you know, she's <laughs> not not the way. Charles, tell yeah. us the answer to all. No, yeah. Throwing it to the wind yeah. can be fun sometimes too, though. Um, you mm -hmm. know, but you're right. It is, you know, the 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 kind of present moment, you know, like that one step at a time and the path will unfold, you know. Like I'm sure like you, like you didn't did you know you would be here? doing podcast interviews and publishing viral videos. And I mean, 30, 40 years ago, probably not. You didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, back then, that's true. <laughs> books, best-selling books. Now, I want to shift topics a little to talk a little bit about um, something that has come up a lot within the whole psychedelic plant medicine space. And it's going to be more of a topic as, as years go by and this growth, um, you know, with venture capital and psychedelic uh, funds being set up and businesses and LLCs and corporations are being set up in the psychedelic space. Um, we all know that this is happening. And then, of course, there's been a lot of crit criticism about where's money come into the psychedelic space. Um, I personally, so I'm just a solopreneur who's been kind of at it for many years, but you know, it's not like I'm there with multiple millions. I'm not setting up any VC fund for psychedelics. And I have personally gotten critiques once in a blue moon about, you know, who are you to talk about this? Sacred plant medicine should be free for all. You know, like this comes from the earth and no one should have any money in it. Of course, you know, that would be nice. Um, but I always say, look, if you've ever seen ayahuasca being made, it's a huge amount of human labor. It, it does take you know, there's work involved. Um, but I'm curious, you know, what is your view on how money plays a part or should it not play a part in this whole psychedelic renaissance? Um, because money, of course, becomes this big argumentative place, you know, like, oh, the, all these bad companies, but then people need healing or maybe people don't need healing or how do you make it accessible? So there's a lot of issues here. One of, yeah. one of them is, Here's the system as we know it, and how do we interface with that system, practically speaking, and not try to be so pure that we end up not being able to do anything at all. Like, you could apply that same thinking to lots of issues like, well, you know, fossil fuel combustion is killing the planet. So, um, but are you going to live with zero, like go off in the woods and live off grid and like not... Uh, even if you can do that, is that the best thing for the planet? So that issue comes up, but but really, like there's the core of the critique is a um, a very legitimate disturbance at the reduction of the sacred. Anytime something sacred is wrapped into the money world, bad things happen. It ends up getting desecrated. So. I personally like to use gift economics in my work when anything sacred is involved. I don't insist on it, but 
it is a viable business model. And it doesn't mean no money is involved. But here's, I have some friends who are um, setting up a psychedelic retreat center. And, and I said, okay, here's how it should work. All right, just, just a modest proposal. You charge for accommodations and food at the center, but the medicine is by gift. So somebody will pay for room and board, and then they decide what they would like to pay as a gift in gratitude for the medicine itself and for the time of the people serving the medicine. And it comes from a place of, wow, thank you so much for doing this work. I would like to support you in doing that work. So in that way, the medicine itself is not being bought and sold, but it is appreciated. And those who are serving the medicine are supported, not because they're like, well, if you don't give me that, I'm not going to give to you. It's not from an energy of withholding, but it's from an energy of trust. I trust that if I give this to you, that you or somebody else will support me in turn. Because my contribution is recognized by the universe. Beings are always watching me. And if I am sincere in my gift, then the flow to receive is also open. And I have to receive that too. And I'm willing to receive that. So it's not like, ooh, I'm not going to touch money. It is... It is, I trust and accept the inflow and the outflow. So this is, you know, I've used this model for retreats. I haven't been serving psychedelics, but, you know, I've been serving whatever medicine I carry through my words. And I do it that way. Like I used to teach at Esalen before, you know, I was, um, uh, I don't think I'm welcome there anymore for various reasons, but mm -hmm. having to do with um, Rule. my opinions on yeah. COVID issues. Yeah. Yeah. However, when I, when I was teaching there, um, I made an arrangement with the institution that the normal faculty payment wouldn't, that would be taken off the um, participants bill. So they would only be paying for Esalen itself, not for the program. And then they would choose how much to give me. And that meant that like some young person without a lot of money, you know, or some, you know, like they wouldn't have to give anything. And that would be welcome. And then if somebody was more established later in life, had had more financial wealth, then they could give me an amount that expressed their gratitude. And if they weren't grateful at all and were like, Charles, this kind of sucked. I wasted five days. Then I didn't want them to give from that energy. Mm -hmm. And that, that rarely happened. But, but you know, like it's not for everybody, you know. So, so this is the principle of gift that, mm -hmm. that people just have to understand. It's not like when I, when I talk to people about this and suggest it for their business, they're like, oh, well, that might be fine for you, but I have to, I have a mortgage to pay. I have to make money. And I'm like, you don't understand. People want to support you. They want to show their gratitude. You will be supported and not just in intangible things. People will give you money. If you are doing good work in the world, they will be grateful. They will want to support you. Mm -hmm. And because psychedelics are so sacred, I think that, that this is a prime arena to use gift economics. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, you know, some practitioners are out there listening and we'll give it a try. And it's, it, you know, I'll just also say like to make it work, often there's a lot of inner work that has to happen because you'll get confronted by, well, so-and-so, I know that they're wealthy and they didn't give very much. Yeah. And, and, and okay, so are you actually doing it? Are you actually in gift? Mm -hmm. Or maybe, yeah, like all kinds of resentment comes up, uh, all kinds of fear comes up, control comes up. Let me kind of guilt them into it. <laughs> you don't have to do that. And the more you let go of that, any kind of control, and the more you trust 
generosity, and gratitude, the more you animate generosity and gratitude. Mm-hmm. When you stand in that reality, you become an attractor for that reality. And so you don't have to go into like magical new age, you know, uh, the secret law of attraction stuff to believe that. Yeah. People can sense if you're trying to milk them for money. Mm-hmm. People can sense when you say, trust yourself, any amount is welcome. Choose what feels good and right for you. We're good. Mm-hmm. Like people sense that. And again, like it doesn't always work. And in fact, I can guarantee you that there will be a moment where it looks like it doesn't work because that's you're being asked, are you serious about this? Mm-hmm. And also maybe you're being shown ways in which you're not actually doing what you think, what you tell yourself you're doing. But I just want to tell everybody, this is a viable business model. And it is the business model of the future as more and more of materiality enters the realm of the sacred Mm -hmm. in our perception. Not that it isn't all already sacred, but in our present historical moment, we tend to divide the world into two, the sacred and the profane. And therefore, we treat the world as profane, the material world. No wonder. This is part of the old story. No wonder we're trashing nature Mm -hmm. if we see matter as just matter. So really, this business model is tied into the perception of the sacred. Mm -hmm. And as we step more and more into the sacred and into seeing our work and our labor and all materials as sacred, the gift model then becomes more and more natural. And that's why I say it is the future of Mm. economics. Mm. I hope so. Um, You know, it's funny, my previous business that I launched in 2013, 12, 13, around then, um, was a running apparel brand. I used to be a really big runner. And I produced these clothing with sustainable materials at a small family factory in New York City. And actually, when I went to launch it, there was a startup out of Portland, Oregon. I think it was Portland that was doing um, pay as you wish e-commerce. And it was like this plug in. And so I launched my running apparel brand as pay as you wish. And it was, you know, it it was an interesting experiment. It was kind of new at the time, you know, which wasn't really that long ago, but it wasn't as accepted. And, um, it was interesting. There was a suggested price and, Some people paid a lot more, and to be honest, most paid the suggested minimum. Um, And then, yeah, some paid under. And, of course, you know, it was fun for a launch. It got some press. That was exciting. But at the same time, there was that reality of like, wait, I only made money on a few of those shorts. Um, And, you know, so I'm wondering, you know, with this whole – the model of of capitalism and business and, you know, the the truth is that there are these – um, corporations established that are getting into um, patenting psilocybin strains or, you know, ketamine therapy or, um, you know, I've talked to someone who's working on a like some kind of new patent of MDMA where it's going to be marketed for this one specific thing, kind of just like a Viagra or whatever else. Um, and I'm wondering, can this fit into that model? You know, how does the gift economy or seeing, um, you know, like seeing these medicines or anything as sacred, how can it fit into our current model of capitalism or can it, or is this where it needs to be this whole, um, I keep saying like, is this whole model of, of economics that we currently have, is it going to collapse? Is it going to just go away one day? The current model of economics is inconsistent and incompatible with the consciousness that is emerging Mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. And it's incompatible with the story of interbeing, the story of reunion, the new story. Uh, And so it is uh, hard to interface with it when you are doing something of the new story. And if you try to shoehorn it into existing economic models, then it gets distorted and reduced. So, yeah, like, you know, it's not just with psychedelics. I mean, um, music and film, they were supposed to be liberated by the Internet. 
But what happened is that artificial scarcity was created in order for people to be able to continue to profit from it. And yeah, so that's what like, like the whole edifice of intellectual property law is itself, um, I would call it pathological. Like, like the term of patents and copyrights keeps getting extended and extended and extended. At the founding of this country, it was like 14 years. Now it's like 70 years after the death of the creator for copyrights. So like Harry Potter, you won't be able to make your own Harry Potter stories freely until like the year, you know, 2140 or something probably like, like that. So so like, and, and like in the psychedelic world, I, I, I heard that there was a patent for the technology of, of one practitioner, one person taking medicine with headphones on listening to trans, trancey music. Mm. Like someone decided to patent that. Mm. So basically patents are kind of an enclosure and it comes, it, they seem quite natural if you believe that individual human beings are actually the authors of their ideas. But I don't see myself that way. I didn't create the ideas that I speak. They come through the collective mind. They come from source. They come from spirit. And, and so the people who are critiquing the economic models around psychedelics, I think they have a valid point. Mm -hmm. We did not create the brain and its neurotransmitters and, and the plants and the, the toads and even the chemistry. Like the chemistry is also, in a sense, discovered. It could be through a, a flash of inspiration. That's one of the ways that the guardians intervene in our reality. They offer someone a flash of inspiration and they come up with a, an invention. And it could be a psychedelic compound. It could be, you know, a energy coherence mat or something like that. Um, it could be a, a poem. It could be an idea, right? That's, that's the intervention. So if we properly understand ourselves and reality, then intellectual property does not make sense. And it's actually a form of enclosure of privatizing something that is actually supposed to be in the commons. Mm -hmm. And we are in that legacy reality right now. We are in those legacy systems. So I'm not going to condemn somebody for doing their best to live and engage in those systems. But let's recognize where we want to go so that when the step is available to us to go in that direction, that we do it and don't step back into the past. Yeah, no, it's um, it's it's been a hard thing to grapple with, right? It's like we're living in these two worlds or we're stepping into a new potential of of the world that exists in more harmony and because it is it you know it's interesting just hearing this um when I interviewed Paul Stamets a few years ago and he told me he's actually putting in protective patents you know I, I actually started crying during our interview I was like wow this is kind of a strange world that we're we're now having to put in protective patents for psilocybin strains I mean just to protect it from the other you know companies or people that want to take it right and it comes back to this this model of the separation right the scarcity like what is yeah i don't know if i buy that i mean no. you, if you put something in the public domain then it becomes unpatentable by anybody so why do you have to patent it yourself hmm. maybe there's something i'm not understanding here but um <laughs> I mean, I yeah. think, I mean, I don't know. He didn't explain it, but I think what it was was this idea that um, there are companies out there who are now trying to patent psilocybin strains so that they don't become public domain. They become now owned by a pharmaceutical company, which is kind of crazy to think about. I mean, even a lot of people have this concern, especially around something like a mushroom that grows, you know, inherently naturally, right, or a plant, that is is public domain. It's part of it's for the all. It's it's Earth. But, you know, this is the the model of separation, right? Let's come in and take it and make money off of it and make it um, you know, only attainable by me as a corporation because it's under my patent now. I mean, this has been happening with, with you know, with Monsanto and Bayer and Syngenta, you know, going finding indigenous cultivars, you know, and modifying them a tiny bit and patenting them and basically like 
this is, yeah, this has got to stop. How do we, but how do we get out of this, you know, other than just say no, you know, or boycott it or not buy it or not shop on Amazon or whatever it is like how, you know, cause it is, you know, especially for those, this desperate, you know, the, the people that are desperate for the healing, right. Or people that are like, I've tried everything. Um, I heard the ketamine is going to work. Let me go work with this ketamine company. Um, or I heard that psilocybin will um, help my fear of death, and now the only place I can get it is from this one corporation because they're the only ones that have, you know, the legal control that's distributing it to the legal therapists. Like, how do we, how do we stand apart from that world that, that sometimes seems like we are heading in that direction where there's a lot of fear around, like, are we going to lose this? Ab- I mean, we're not going to lose our ability to grow our own psilocybin and work with it ceremonially. Well, we could lose our ability to do that. I mean, in some of, some of the uh, cannabis laws in some states, like, you know, you can grow it in your gigantic indoor concentration camp for plants, you know, but you can't grow it in your garden. So, like, there is a level where we need to get active politically mm-hmm. and stand for what's right. It's just that simple. Mm-hmm. So, so, and then there's another systems level about, you know, maybe there's people who are impassioned about changing intellectual property laws. And then there's the moral level um, of saying, hey, if you're like a chemist inventing, discovering new compounds, or, you know, you're breeding new plants with psychedelic properties, how about you put them in the public domain? Mm-hmm instead of privatizing them. Like there's, there's, and uh, maybe my legal knowledge isn't um, deep enough and there's a, there's a reason why you can't do that. But, you know, like, I think all of us have an opportunity to, to, to choose, to step toward where we know we want to go. Mm-hmm. And we also have the power to, hold that possibility for others. So maybe, you know, some, someone who's wanting to bring psychedelics to the world and thinking, well, okay, I have to play along with the system. I have to patent this process. I have, and maybe when somebody, when one of us says, you don't have to do that. And I know on some level, you would rather have another way that is more aligned with what you have learned from psychedelics. And that involves some courage. Like you have to let go of something, but we're here with you and we're watching you. Mm-hmm. It's a lot easier to be courageous when you know somebody's watching. Courage is a group function, you know? And it's not just someone's watching, it's when somebody knows who you are for real mm-hmm. and holds you in that prophecy. That's an invitation. Mm. To effectively offer that invitation, it sure helps if you have experience accepting that invitation into who you are too. Mm. If you know, because then you know that this is what a human being can do. A human being can surrender. A human being can let go. A human being can trust generosity. A human being doesn't have to guard so tightly if you know that from your direct experience of yourself, then you also become a lot better able to hold that prophecy for other people. Mm. And so that's a kind of a circulation of a gift because how did, how did you make that step? It's because somebody else maybe saw that in you. Mm. Maybe it was your nanny. Maybe it was your grandmother. Somebody saw you for who you actually are. That is a gift not an accomplishment. Well, maybe it's both. But but when when it has been accomplished, then then it becomes a gift. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, it beautifully said. Um, no, you know, I'm one, I'm wondering in all this because this is also interconnected to this this idea of um, you know that these medicines are available, right? They're they're here maybe to. Like if you're working with the medicines, maybe you're going to be less inclined to want to patent them, right? Because now you have this awareness of 
Maybe, hopefully, I don't, this is my prayer, you know, the interconnectedness, like that this is, you know, we are all one, you know, and I, it always sounds so cliche, but it is actually very real, right? Like there is no separation. Um, so it, but there is this kind of chicken and egg thing, right? There's, there's a lot of criticism around, well, people are taking too many of these medicines, you know, we're, um, there's a toad that's now endangered and there's, supposedly ayahuasca is being, you know, unsustainably harvest. I've heard actually mixed things about this. Um, you know, I know it takes seven or eight years to get it to maturity to then brew it. And, you know, like I've he heard so many stories, like everybody I know is now a combo practitioner serving the frog medicine. And so there's a lot of this, you know, craving for the healing or craving for the expansion of our consciousness through these medicines. But then there's also the, um, this consumeristic, um, model of just taking, 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 you know, like the same um, cycle that we're perpetuating of like, you know, just grabbing and taking for ourselves. So where do we bring this? You know, do you believe that there is a way to bring that into balance? Or, you know, there's moments where I'm like, maybe the whole world does need ayahuasca. Maybe if everybody just had this, we would solve the problem. Or maybe we should all cut back and just go inward and meditate, you know, like, what are your views on on this? Because it comes up so much in the psychedelic community as well. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I think that the those guys in the '60s were right. You know, just put LSD in the water supply. <laughs> but you know, having you know put LSD in my own internal water supply, and then a few months later, not having changed that much, or so it seemed, and having seen, like, I mean. You know, you're in this space too. I mean, there's some people who have done an awful lot of ayahuasca and are still psychopaths in some cases. Yes. You know, like it's not like you should trust somebody just because they've done a lot of medicine. So it is not sufficient. Like it's no guarantee that people are going to be sourcing their products in an ecologically conscious fashion. And it brings up for me, like, and this is maybe a little bit of a tangent, but um, it brings up for me the importance of community to, like, there's a lot of talk about integration. You know, how do you integrate your experience? And that, again, often is, it's like, comes up, it, it takes a form of a prescription on things that you're supposed to do. Maybe you're working with a practitioner. But really to integrate it, I think we need a psychedelic community to hold in common a different story. And there is some of that. Like there is um, a lot of ecological consciousness, like, like the fact that this is even an issue, the sourcing of the toad and the frog and the ayahuasca. And it's an issue for, for quite, a, quite a number of medicines. Like that's good that it's an issue. That's good that a collective... Uh, moral, moral, a collective value is emerging about that. That's how it happens. And maybe that can extend to other ways of inhabiting the new story that psychedelics temporarily transport us into, but cannot hold us in. How do, <clears throat> how do people stay in a new story? <clears throat> Excuse me. We're held there by community. That's what culture is. It's the collective holding of a story. And that's why, I mean, not to, you know, flatter you too much, but that's why like this kind of podcast is really important. This is one of the ways that a new story uh, takes root in the psychedelic community. So the, like, yeah, I mean, these conversations are like the, you know, the signaling molecules of an organism that is emerging today. But yeah, like, I don't have an answer. Like, you know, again, it's, you know, are people taking too much psychedelics? Not enough. Should they be doing this? Should they be doing that? Again, that's like a very personal, unique question. There could be, I mean, my answer is who's asking? Mm -hmm. And there might be somebody, if I'm tuning into them, I'm like, yeah, you have 
receive so much from psychedelics and you haven't integrated, you haven't digested that food yet. So don't keep eating it. You know, maybe you do meditate for a year and somebody else, I'll be like, yeah, your, your desire to do it again and do it again, that's because the process isn't finished. You need more. Do it every week, you know, like, and, and it's hard on your own to know that. Mm -hmm. This idea that, that each of us knows, can source all the healing from within. That's an improvement on sourcing it from an authority figure <laughs> or authoritarian institutions. But really where it needs to come from is community. And that might include trusted elders. That might include people that you deeply respect. That might include your peers. That might, it includes like, you know, the whole ecosystem of human relationships. And that's what we really quite don't have yet. But it is emerging. That's how the transition happens. Yeah, and it's interesting you bring up community. It's come up for so many people. It is the number one word I've been hearing for especially the last two years is like, I crave community. Where's my community? Um, you know, COVID has made a lot of people question their where where's home? Where's community? Where should I live? Who, you know, especially now that communities are being divided. I've seen this even within my own various medicine communities. There's a division on belief systems and, you know, vaccines, and I could go on and on. Um, and it has been interesting to watch, you know, community has been harder than ever because now here we are um, not allowed to go do things or isolated depending on where you live. There's different rules. Um, then there's different, you know, levels of fear. Um, and there is not this deeper connection like, yeah, there's online communities. I have online communities. It's great. It's better than nothing, but it's not really that depth of connection to do that, the day-to-day -day integration, you know, or even just have these kind of discussions or have someone even turn to. And this seems to be a huge problem in our society. I mean, I know a lot of people notice this. And like you said, like I grew up like you, I grew up with, um, you know, cable didn't really exist when I grew up until later. And we just played on the streets and we knew one another. And there was this sense of, you know, exploration and wonder. And now I watch my nephews and I don't, they don't even go outside. They don't like to be outside. <laughs> so it's, I'm like, and they grow, they live in the same area where I grew up in California. Um, so, you know, I'm wondering like this, this community issue, and I mean, is this connected to this deeper separation? And where did this, you know, like, where did this all come from? And where are we going? Because I know there is this craving, especially within the consciousness, right? These conscious um, communities or people that are waking up and realizing like, this is maybe one of the solutions is to start gathering together. Kind of like the video that you, you and um, Aubrey and John, who is it? John Hopkins, John Hopkins did, right? This video that went viral recently about the tribe. Gathering, gathering of together. the tribe. Yeah, gathering yeah. the tribe. But yeah. how, like, are we just keep going and this will come through? Or, you know, should we be intentionally trying to create more community? Should we all just take our masks off and say fuck it and gather together? I mean, what what do you what do you see as like this um you know, the answer to this lack of community. Or maybe it's just me and everybody I know. <laughs> first, first is to recognize the lack, mm -hmm. um, to recognize the wanting and validate it. Because human beings need it. Mm -hmm. we, we cannot thrive in isolation. Life itself does not thrive in isolation and we are life. And then also to recognize the difficulty of our circumstances. It's very hard to create community when in many, many ways we don't need each other because we meet so many of our needs through technology and markets. Uh, indigenous community, everybody in that village relies on everybody else for food, clothing, entertainment. You know, you get together and sing. Well, what in a, in a typical modern house, what do you need your neighbors for? And how did that happen? That's 
what I wrote Sacred Economics about, actually. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a function of the money system, ultimately. But even deeper than that, the stories of the, of the separate self and so forth. Um, so that, so, so yeah, so first recognize the validity of the yearning. Secondly, um, recognize the difficulty of our situation. And then thirdly, understand what community is. It's not just get togethers. It's that you all care about something more than yourselves. You may have experienced real community on a sports team or on a, you know, in a band, something like the show must go on. So even though I don't like you, I'm going to get along with you. We're going to work it out. We're going to find some way to do it because this is important. If you don't have that, then as soon as some conflict arises, the community just splits apart. You've probably seen that happen yes. many times. Yes. But so, so ultimately to, to, for, to to reestablish community, we have to care about something together. And I think that one of the gifts of the COVID time is that it has revealed some things that we actually care about um, and that, that we're willing to sacrifice to work for. Mm. Um, and the same could be said in, in the psychedelic space. Like it could be legalization, um, it could be, um, you know, uh, ecological consciousness, um, or it could be like something much more specific, like um, getting together to create a healing retreat center or something like that. Something that you can, can devote to. Um, but yeah, there's no easy, like you can't, it's not easy to, it, I'm not sure if I want to use the word easy. It is, it goes against the general, um, the general rhythm of our society to, 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 to start community. Mm. Like I could go around to my neighbors and meet them and invite them over for dinner and stuff. But unless the power goes out, we don't have community. As soon as the power goes out, which it did for a few days, like we started having community. We started borrowing generators from each other, you know, and do you have water? Our wells aren't working. And and like, like we started having community. Mm -hmm. And those times could be coming mm -hmm. with breakdowns in supply chains, economic collapse, the power grid, who knows? Mm -hmm. Like we might discover community in that way where we have to take care of each other. A community is is basically a bunch of people who need each other. They could need each other for survival or they could need each other because they're creating something together. Mm. But that's what a community is. Yeah, I'm glad we had an opportunity to address this before we go because it, it has been something that's come up. It's something that comes up within, you know, the, the psychedelic space, especially um, as people are embarking into these realms for the first time and then they have no one to turn to. I mean, that's what happened to me when I really dove in, you know, about 10 years ago. It was like, Wait, I don't have anybody to even connect with over these experiences and this larger vision I have for the world and this larger vision for my own life. And like you said, even just down to the basics of like, okay, how do we all survive this? Um, and it has been interesting. I went from living in an apartment in New York City to living out in the country where I can see a farm out the window. And it has been such a different experience to connect with neighbors and, you know, the pandemic, like brought us closer together to understand, okay, well, what do you have? And what do you offer? And what do you do? And oh, okay, here, like borrow this, borrow that. And it is, and it's not even close to being an intentional community or anything like that, but just to even connect with people under crisis. And like you said, these times might be coming, you know, we'll see. And, um, you know, this is what it's going to take is, you know, like, like you're like the viral video, the gathering of the tribes, you know, gathering together with, hopefully with a shared vision of what is what is this new world that we're creating together? You know, why are we here and what are we doing? And um, we'll see. But Charles, before we go, any parting words, any, um, you know, one word of uh, wisdom you want to leave the audience with? And then also, you know, what do you have coming up this year? Like anything you want to share and tell everybody about? As far as what's coming up this year, I... 
kind of feel like I'm at a crossroads. And I, I, I pause there. And maybe I'll continue going on the road that I've been. Maybe, you know, I'll keep publishing on Substack and keep writing essays and stuff and maybe some more film collaboration. Uh, but maybe I'll take a different path. And, you know, such is the gift of an interruption of the momentum of normal. And right now we're like at the very last moment before a new normal resumes for better or for worse. So, and, and this is like a lot of people in the last couple of weeks, and we're recording this in what, like mid, late January. So maybe it's still true. I think it's gonna keep going for a little while. A lot of people have been in very deep inward states in despair. Um, it's like, this is like the last gasp of the interruption of normality. So hold it precious, this last moment at the crossroads, because once you start down one of these paths that radiate out from this juncture, it might be a while before you reach the next crossroads. So if you are at a crossroads where you feel like you can choose what your next path will be, yeah, hold this moment as, as precious. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. It really means a lot to me to have you here and to take almost two hours to share your voice and share these words of wisdom with this community, with everybody who needs to hear this during these beautiful, very, very beautiful and challenging, interesting times that we're in. <sighs> All we can do is yep. love it up and let go, right? I mean, in the end, what? It's not going to get less interesting. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Yeah. You know, it's it, it's yeah. been the, the beauty of this this last few years or even before that where it's like, I have these existential moments in the middle of the night. For some reason, they always happen in the middle of my sleep where I wake up and I'm like, wow, I cannot believe I'm alive right now. This is so fascinating. Yeah. And it's so, it's, it's you know, the, the bigness of it. Like, it's so beautiful and it's so scary, but it's it's both. And that's just like, wow, what more could you want? That is this ecstasy of being a human, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Thank you so much, Charles. It was such an honor to have you here. Many blessings to you. Thank you, Beth. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you're feeling inspired, I'd appreciate it if you showed your love with a review. And check out my YouTube channel where you can find the video version of this podcast. You can also head to BethAWeinstein.com to learn more about me and grab my free business growth trainings. Remember, you carry your own unique medicine and your medicine is what we need for these times.